<clears throat> Up next, the bellhop's initial thoughts on Cthulhu Death May Die from Simon. Actually, I think Sean will have some thoughts on this one, too, since he played it, too. Uh, Cthulhu Death May Die is a new cooperative board game by Rob Davio and Eric M. Lang. These are two names that if you are a board game enthusiast, you should recognize. Rob Davio is the godfather of uh, legacy games, and Eric M. Lang is the godfather of awesome-looking miniatures on a map-type games, I bet. I would basically call it. Uh, it blew up on Kickstarter last year. Uh, it featured the largest miniature ever produced for a board game, which we already kind of talked about in the last segment. Uh, this miniature is so big that it is the board that you move your miniatures on. I got to admit, it is amazing. The retail vision version just hit stores November 1st. So, you know, anyone who complains, we don't talk about the new hotness. Here's us proving you wrong. Uh, the retail version is what we're going to be talking about today. I don't have any three-foot-tall Cthulhu. If I did, it'd be in the backdrop right there. Uh, now, and, I do have to send out a shout out to Solon from Tabletop Renaissance, Windsor's newest game store. Uh, he was awesome enough to give me a copy of this game to review, eh, mainly to drum up local interest in the game. No other compensation was provided. So this was uh, a Kickstarter this past summer. They made $2.4 million on this Kickstarter. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and things have just... Uh, I think some backers received their game a little bit before... Uh, the end of uh, October, depending on you know, depending on where you are and who you are, uh, but even most of those didn't. Uh... Yeah, I got to admit, it depends on what you ordered. I think yeah. if you just got the retail box, you probably got the retail box. If you got the add-ons, you probably haven't gotten your game yet. I know a lot of people, since I've been tweeting out about this game a lot recently, have been saying, "Can't wait to get my copy! Can't wait to get my copy!" And I've been really happy. I haven't seen anyone going, "Damn it! How do you have a copy and I don't?" So it must be well communicated. Yeah. I did not back it. Um, I re I do remember it took me a bit until like it was after I did the unboxing. I actually remembered seeing the Kickstarter and deciding not to not to back it. Yeah. So you can check out the unboxing video of this on our YouTube channel, and it has been quite popular. Yes. Uh, it's raking in the views almost as fast as the Gloomhaven FAQ, and at this rate, it may even end up passing that if it stays yeah. popular. This is the the. I don't know. I think it's a combination of Sean did a bit more work on the post on it. Plus, I did a new format for unboxing videos, which you'll see in the coming weeks. Uh, not this Monday's, because this Monday's was recorded a while ago. But all our new unboxing videos, I went for another angle where we can show off the product a lot better, I think. And I think that helps, because we do get to show off all the miniatures. Plus, this game's hot. Absolutely. So, we're going to start off talking about the production quality. Uh, this is why we're talking about the unboxing video. Like, really, you got to see this uh, or see it in person. If you can see it in person to get the full effect, this is one of the best looking games I've seen. Like, everyone knows Cool Mini or Not games look great and come with great miniatures, but these are over the top, even for Cool Mini or Not. Like, the detail and the posing, like, they have done stuff that I know back in the day you couldn't do with molds. So, I don't know how they were able to get them at these angles and stuff, but like, you even get little tentacle miniatures for tracking your stats instead of wooden cubes. It's just over-the-top miniatures. Yeah. Now, not only are the minis great, and one of the things we were noticing uh, was things like fabric. Uh, the yeah. the fabric is so detailed that all you need, all it really needs is a quick wash, and the detail in that fabric will just pop on cloaks and things like that. Uh, but as well as the minis as expected, the cardboard is nice and solid, mm -hmm. and of course, the character art is right up there with a lot of what they're putting out lately. So you've got some really nice looking art for all your characters and on the boxes yeah, and, and agreed. whatnot. I, 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 a props to the art that I didn't have in the original review when I wrote this is um, appropriately dressed characters. We'll put it that way. There's there's no cheesecake beefcake here. It's it's everything looks realistic. It's probably the wrong term for a Cthulhu <laughs> game. True. But, but it's, it's Reasonable. not that overly, yeah. yes. Reasonably overly dressed. dressed. Yeah. They, they aren't they aren't flaunting body parts as they're about yeah. to wade into battle, which I thought was really impressive for yeah. <laughs> even for an Eric Lang game, to be honest. <laughs> uh, now, besides the minis, the game also comes with some of the best looking map tiles I've seen. Like these are really nice map tiles. And I got to note, they're different than Mansions of Madness because they're similar style. It's a similar theme. You're doing insides of buildings as well as corridors and, and chambers and hallways and stuff like that. Um, there's counters to punch out. Everything's well cut, good quality. Everything's really nice looking. Now, this is where we're going to end up talking about some of our first problems with the game. Because I will say, there's no question that these are beautiful tiles. 
the the maps look gorgeous it's really yeah. easy to see where doors are uh laying them out was easy and quick as soon you know you look at the map that the scenario map and it lays it out that's great and then you try to put things on them and that's where the first real problem of this game i think comes out um you're dealing with cthulhu and greater demons and things that are big nasty monsters well big nasty monsters and small beautiful rooms don't really match uh and so we'll get a little more into that a little a little later but they uh, as beautiful as they are they didn't think through their sizing maybe 100 <laughs> percent. yeah i'll be getting to that one later i saved my final thoughts for after i talk about everything but that is is also one of my complaints now the rule book's nice glossy full color filled with artwork and examples uh i gotta say it's really easy to read and there is an example for every action in the game. So, like, literally, like, here's a thing, here's an example, here's a thing, here's an example. No complaints there at all. Yeah, I mean, you all, you unboxed it on Thursday. We played it Friday night, mm -hmm. um, and none of us read the rule books, just you. And we didn't really have any questions or concerns. I mean, the yeah, game I don't, I don't played... even remember having to grab the book, like, more than once or twice, and it was for really odd edge yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the game, do it. you know... I mean, yes, Mo can teach games well, but the fact of the matter is you still usually have to refer to the book because mm -hmm. it's just so much. No, the game played really well. Yeah. Uh, then in the box, you have a bunch more boxes. Uh, there's the Rob Davio influence. The base game comes with six scenario boxes. These are individual little boxes that are in there. Uh, if you played Gloomhaven, it kind of looks like the different character packs. And then two giant Elder God boxes. The scenario boxes, when you open them up, have a bunch of cards and the stuff needed to set up each scenario. Uh, this can include more punch boards and tokens. I don't know if they all do. We only opened up a couple of them. Elder God box represents your main baddie, who you want to fight. Base box gives you Cthulhu and he who shall not be named. The Elder God box also comes with more cards and punch outs and, of course, some really kick-ass minis. Uh, the Cthulhu one comes with two miniatures, Cthulhu and a star sign, and the other one comes with, it looks like a priestess and he who shall not be named himself. The first one, not the modern Voldernut who he, that Voldernut totally stole someone else's stick there. <laughs> um, all this fits great into the box. Um, better than most cool mini or not games, I gotta admit. Uh, there's a place for everything, except for the room tiles. So They'll just kind of nest on top. Uh, the game even includes a card that shows you where to put the minis. Thank you very much for that cool mini. That is something I wish they'd done in, say, Rising Sun. Because every time I go to Clan Up Rising Sun, it's a matter of, does this guy fit here? No, does he fit here? Uh, as for just what you get in the box, I was blown away. I th This was really impressive presence just from looking at what you get. Now, I think when it comes to the packaging, it, absolutely. The only complaint we had was there's one set of cards that slips around and wasn't really well secured. Um, and I think that you'll be picking those up every time you start it. But it's only one small deck of cards. It's not even a full deck. Um, so that wasn't a huge deal. See, I now, think you could have, we could have probably put that in another spot. It would have stayed better. Mm -hmm. I just tried to put it back where it came out of. Well, yeah, no, understandably. But there wasn't, I mean, there wasn't a, there's no designed place to hold it where it's not going to slide yeah, around. You'd, not, you'd have yeah, to bag the top it. cards aren't going to slide off. Yeah, you'd have to bag it. Uh, and now with, with the boxes, the great thing with this is it's a mix and match system. So mm -hmm. even though in the initial, in the retail box, you're only getting season one, uh, the Kickstarter people were able to get season two and some extra bit doodads. Uh, so you're getting six scenarios, uh, episodes one through six, and two uh, uh, Elder Demon boxes, but you now mix and match those. So you've actually, right out of the box, got 12 completely different possible scenarios mm -hmm. you can be playing. Uh, and I think from what I could tell, they really are pretty different just by swapping, you know, uh, episode one between He Who Shall Not Be Named and Cthulhu are going to be reasonably different scenarios. Um, oh, I agree. Once you pick your scenario and your Elder God to fight, you're going to pick a character. There were plenty of options. Uh, I didn't count, but like way more than one per player, way more than five. I think it was probably eight or ten. Um, I was actually really pleased to see the selection of characters. Not only did you have men and women, not only did you have people of color, but they actually included an amputee. That is not something you see and is awesome to see in 2019. And they had a non-sexualized child as well. Yes. Uh, it, you know, it's really nice to see something as simple as what is, in, in a sort of very distilled essence, a shoot 'em up mm -hmm. taking the time to be that, you know, fully uh, inclusive conscious. In its yeah. and conscious of its characters. Uh, for Again, it's really just a shoot 'em up it's a, it's a really fun shoot 'em up 
and they still took the time and effort for that. Yeah, and Deanna points out in the chat room, full range of ages too. You had kids yep. to old older people. Yep. It was nice to see. Now, when you pick your character, you get three skills. These are on a character card. Uh, two of the skills other people may have, but one of which is unique, making it somewhat asymmetric. Adding to the asymmetry, you're going to draw a card from the Psychosis deck. Everyone's going to have their own. This is an in-game effect that goes off as your character descends into insanity. This is a Cthulhu game. It's an inevitable part of the game. Of course, there's insanity in the game. Uh, there's a significant deck of these, and they include a ton of things. One of the most amusing, I, at least I thought amusing, was the Obsessive Compulsive, where when you collect items, they go on the right side of your board or the left side, and you have to have an equal number on both sides. Uh, my particular character, when I played, had a problem where they would go into a catatonic state and lay on the floor quivering, which actually was an in-game bonus because all the bad guys would avoid me while I was drooling on the floor. Now, there are certainly some people who will take issues with this game's use of... Uh, mental instability, mental health yeah. problems. Uh, and while we understand that, at the same point, part of the Cthulhu miso mythos is the fact that it is driving you out of your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. It is too much for the human mind to comprehend, and the human mind compensates by developing psychoses. Uh, no one is expecting, or no one should be expecting, a realistic portrayal of mental health mental disabilities illness. and mental illness in this game. Uh, and I don't think what they saw was especially uh, gratuitous. Yes, it's there, and for better or worse, but uh, even like the OCD um, aspect, um, it, there was game issues. It wasn't as simple as make, moving things left and right because it looked better. That actually has a game effect because these mm -hmm. left and right sides of your item cards actually have different effects. So it wasn't as simple as making things look pretty and minimizing the dangers of OCD and, and the, the, the real impact of OCD. It actually had real impact on that character. Um, so yeah, basically what my, my suggest would be to check out our episode on potentially problematic content. Know that it's here, make your own decision whether this is something you are willing to support or not. Personally, I think it's part of the genre, it's part of the trope, it's part of the Cthulhu mythos, always has been. And this game is going to push it, because this is an over-the-top Cthulhu game. And everyone's got a psychosis, and they're going to hit multiple times, and uh, we lost the game due to a psychosis when we played. Because someone just couldn't handle themselves and attacked everyone around them. That's the kind of thing you're going to expect from this game. Now, once everyone is their characters, you're going to set up the map based on the scenario box. It's going to have tiles and put counters out and stuff like that. Now, the goal of the game, there's a ritual going on. You have to stop it. The ritual is trying to summon an elder god. If you're too slow, the elder god's going to get summoned, which could suck. If you can stop the elder, uh, stop the ritual, you actually can then harm the elder god. It becomes flesh and can be killed. It's then up to the players to kick some butt and take down that Elder God. Now, there is also a time limit uh, that is reached. Uh, if the, the Elder God progresses too far along the track, you just lose. Uh, you can also lose if one character dies before the ritual is disrupted, or if all characters die after it's disrupted. Yeah, it's nice that there's a variety of win-lose scenarios here. Uh, it's not just a simple, if the God comes, you die. If the God doesn't, you win. No, no, yeah. there's the God is going to come. Uh, <laughs> you are going to fight the big baddie. You don't have any way around that. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, it's not going to be so easy that you just blow through it and don't have to worry about Cthulhu. Uh, no, he's going to show up and it's going to hurt. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there are multiple ways to both lose and, uh, and win. So again, it's, you know, the flexibility in the game is really strong. And a correction, we did win. I was forgetting that I died and then realized I could have spent something and came back. We had thought we lost and then didn't. I played a lot of games over the last few days. Sorry. <laughs> we did win. We did take a lot of damage from Tori in particular's character's problem. <laughs> All right. So on your turn, you're going to take three actions. They're simple. Running, which is moving. Attacking, which is attacking something on the board. Resting, which you can do if no one's around to get your health back and your energy back. And trading items. That's it for your basic actions. Nice and simple. In addition, each scenario has two special actions. I thought this was neat. It was just a neat mechanic. Each of the six scenarios has six different actions. 
in the one we played, the only one I remember, I remember one of them was there were laboratories and cultists were trying to set fires at these laboratories and we could smash the laboratories. That's how we had to disrupt the rituals. And then our other, remember what our, our other one was putting out fires because uh, they, yes. they were setting fires and, and part of the, the theme of the whole uh, thing was, was fires everywhere. Lots and yes. lots of fire. There was uh, lots of fire. <laughs> Because basically the scenario was, what's worse than cultists? Cultists lighting fires. That was the theme of our mission. Yep. Um, attacking and doing scenario actions like fighting fires means rolling dice. Rolling dice in this means rolling three black dice. These are custom dice um, that, that are unique to the game. If you were skilled in something, you got some additional green dice. Plus, if you're far enough on the insanity track, you also got some green dice. You're looking for exclamation marks. If you have at least one exclamation mark, you succeed. Um, there are other symbols, uh, elder sign symbols, which set off special effects, usually tied to your character skills, and then tentacles, and tentacles cause you to lose sanity. Green dice have less harmful symbols on them than the black ones do, so we're always good, so you always wanted more green dice. I, the basics of the game is you want to get more dice, so you are, you are doing whatever necessary, uh, and we'll get to what is necessary in a second, but you're doing whatever is necessary to get more dice so that you have more chances to beat things up. Yep, you're looking for more exclamation points. Uh, now, sanity in this game is very different from every other Mythos game I played. Every Cthulhu game, every, every Lovecraft game has some type of sanity mechanic in it, and this is a game that kind of inverts what you usually say. In Death May Die, the more sanity you lose, the more powerful you get. Losing sanity unlocks new skills, adds more green dice to your pool, and gives you more options. But if you lose too much, you can still be eliminated from the game. It's a very cool push-your-luck mechanic where you're trying to get your character to the brink, to the very edge, to be able to take out the Elder God without going too far. And essentially, uh, my character in this case basically did that. Uh, I, I got positioned into a ideal place early in the game and was protected by the rest of the team. And as I went in slowly insane, I became powerful enough that I was essentially taking on Cthulhu almost by myself uh, in order to wear him down to get finished off. Now, I died moments before the end of the game, but I had all... You went insane. I, 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 I was sorry. Incurably yes. insane. Incurably insane. Uh, and, and, but I, I had done enough at that point that it was okay. Cause there was, it was easy enough for everyone else to finish him off at that point. Uh, so, but because I, uh, gave up my sanity early enough in the game and gained that power quickly, I was able to basically do heavy damage early on. Yeah. Sean's character was basically a little girl that as she lost her mind could start more fires further away. Yeah, I shot <laughs> I shot fire from hands at, at things, basically. Now, after every character's turn, you're going to draw a Mythos card, and the baddies do something. Very Shadows over Camelot to me. Um, after the Mythos phase, all the monsters in the room are going to attack any people with them. Or, sorry, are going to attack you. It only attacks you on your turn. So if you're in a room with monsters, they attack you. They use the same dice. Uh, the interesting thing to note is it doesn't matter who's rolling the dice. If you roll the Insanity symbols, the tentacles, you lose Sanity. So both on your turn and the... Mythos turn, the bad guy's turn, you can lose sanity, which again, you kind of want that to happen, but not too much. Um, if you finish your turn in a room and there are no monsters, you get to investigate. So here's your investigation research that you're used to seeing in these games. But in this, it's really simple. You draw a card from the investigation deck, you read the middle of it. It usually means you found someone or something and you get a choice. These choices are... Um, Moral choices, I will say. Um, they're not explicit, but they very much hint at you do a good thing or a very bad thing. If you do the very bad thing, you tend to get better stuff, but then it can lead to your descent into madness. Um, or you do the good thing and you get followers and things like that. I'm not going to get into the details here of that, but basically you're going to read through, make a choice, and you're going to get something from it. Yeah. Most of the cards are positive. I, didn't re I don't think we saw any that were just a bad thing. It was always you either got something, got nothing, or moved on. Yeah, it's it's a real it's de they're definitely choices though. Uh, you're you you don't get anything for free. It's yeah. essentially part of the part of the thing. I, or I think I think there were some very minor objects that were that had no real notable effect. Uh, but if you wanted something better, then you were going to pay for it in some some manner, in some way. Yeah. So and then there were cards that didn't happen in our game, but they would come back to haunt you. So say you did the bad thing, you would get a card that marked. I'm trying to remember the term that was on the cards and it kept saying, if you are, 
If you have oh, a guilty conscience. Guilty that's what conscience. It was. Guilty yeah. conscience. So if you did the bad thing, you would get a guilty conscience card. And many times we had cards that said, if you have a guilty conscience, this nasty thing happens to you. Yeah. In our game, no one got a guilty conscience. So yeah, no, we we were we were nice people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that's basically it for the game. Uh, take three actions, move, bad guys move, try to stop the ritual, stop the ritual, kill Cthulhu or Haster. I'll say it once. Just make sure I don't say it three times. <laughs> um, so final thoughts. When I got this game, I was expecting Arkham Horror with fancy minis. I, I was expecting a four to six hour slog of flipping cards, moving my pawn around the map, having people read out to me what horrible things was happening to my character and having to make decisions on where to go and being frustrated that stuff was too far away and stuff like that. A game where you're doing research and investigating and gathering clues, trying to figure out how to banish the evil big baddie before going insane. And that's that not, is what not this, is. this game at all. That is not this. This is, yeah, okay, maybe you get clues, but more likely you're going to go in and have to kill some cultists and smash stuff. Sorry go in and smash some stuff and once you smash that stuff a great old one's going to show up and you're going to have to kick it this game is way more about kicking a star spun butt back to where it came from uh losing your sanity in this game is a good thing it's what makes you more capable of dealing with the threats at hand you're going to want to push your sanity to the brink and bring the pain just watch you don't go too far this is two-fisted pulp cthulhu not research and investigation cthulhu this is the Cthulhu of Robert E. Howard, not the Cthulhu of H.P. Lovecraft we're used to seeing. And I got to say, I love seeing this as a difference to what is usually out there. No, absolutely. I, I When I came down on Friday, uh, I, I had a pretty good idea of what I was getting into after watching the unboxing the night before. But it was really enjoyable to just sort of sit down and because we had a rough weekend ahead, not have a brain burning game mm -hmm. and just kick some demon butt. You know, yep. it, that was that was what we did, and that was what sort of uh, fit and, and felt great to do. Yeah. And then added to that, this game is ridiculously quick to set up and get to the table. Like, this is I, this is a game I don't think you necessarily need to read the rule book first. You could break this out with your friends, open it up, flip through the rules, and get it to the table, like, in a, less than half an hour. The rules are clear and concise, and I got to say simple, but not in a, oh, it's a simple game way, but as in a really quick to pick up really... What you do is just simple. You move, you attack. If there's nothing to fight, you research. Draw a card, make a choice, done. Uh, if you roll those tentacles, bad things happen to you. Uh, gameplay is lightning quick. Uh, player turns go really quick. Even with five players, it just flowed. It just it went around the table. It was going really quick. Yeah. We were playing in minutes. Yeah, no, they, the, it's there because the, the, your, your actions are set out right there. Everything's right out in front of you. You can see everything. Uh, can, movement is easy because it's working by rooms. You're not working, worrying yep. about hexes or squares or no counting. line of sight rules at all. You're just, yeah, well, and then that, that may actually come up under one of the problems, I think, in some <laughs> degree. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, everything is right there and, you know, you're rolling and running. It's yep. that simple. Now, Sean's already alluded to it a couple times. It's not all sunshines and roses. I do have some complaints about Cthulhu Death May Die. Now, my first two are really minor, things that can probably be overlooked. The third could be a game breaker and almost was for me. Now, the first thing is, as Sean mentioned earlier, is not being able to fit all the damn minis on the board. The map tiles are just too small. Like, they look great, but they should have been at least twice the size. Or the miniatures half the size, but no one wants that. Like, if you had a room with a cultist or two and one character, you're fine. But then once you have to start throwing in flame counters and relay counters and a lab counter, it's already crowded. But then once you have even one of the larger monsters, there's not enough room. The Cthulhu Mini itself takes up one small room, and there's not room to put other minis on its base or anything like that. It's just, there's no way to do it. You just can't fit them. Plus, there's the minis, then there's the counters that you're supposed to put there, too. Yeah, no, the, the fact that Cthulhu literally takes up all but the very border of a small-sized room yep. is incredibly crazy. Like, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now, luckily, he spawned in a large room, so we didn't even necessarily realize it immediately. But even earlier in the game, uh, a one relay token, a couple of fires, and two cultists and a character, yeah. you're out of space. You're already starting to keep track of things off the edge of the tile. Mm -hmm because you've already run out of space. And that 
is really unfortunate. Uh, to 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 think that within the first three turns, I think uh, the full first full three times around the board, we had run out of space in rooms. That was concerning. And then to acerbate that problem, once things get damaged, you track it by putting tokens on the board. This is horrible. This is a terrible way to track damage in any modern game. Cool Mini or not expects you to put counters out next to the miniatures on the board. Now, even if the rooms were huge, this is impractical. Like, first off, it's terrible because, as Sean said, you got two cultists in there, you got a character, you got a relay token, three fire tokens, and a lab token. You put down this little heart token in there, and then within 10 seconds, wait, was, was that this cultist or this cultist? Like, it's terrible for that. But even with that, like, all the, all the tokens are round. Like, just, they don't, they should be pointy, so you can point at what miniature they're at. There's not enough room to put them there. And then, like, multiple times we'd be playing, and we'd, oh, cultists all charge forward, run square, and you'd move them. And we'd look and go, oh, wait, whose heart was this? Where, who was that from? Right? It just, oh, it's a terrible way to track damage. Yeah. And there aren't even any in some for the cultists, especially there aren't actually ways to really do it better because sure, you could have cards off to the side, but there's no way to link up that cultist with a card on the side that you were tracking data on, at least with, you know, your demons. If you've got Cthulhu, you can have a Cthulhu oh, yeah. card off to the side. Uh, some people have suggested, you know, photocopying something and, and keeping track of your damage that way. Uh, but with the cultists, if you've got three cultists in a room and one of them runs away, you you really have to sort of pay, be really have to have been paying attention uh, right up to the minute yeah. to know which damage counters are going with them. Now there there's ways you can fix this, right? Like I immediately thought back when I ran fourth edition D and D, I have let go arrow system uh, laser cut tokens that I used to put under the minis, and now that's all I had to do is start throwing bloody tokens under my cultists, make a stack under them until they're dead, right? Uh, the photocopy. You could photocopy a bunch of cultists and then paint the bases different colors or put stickers on them that say one, two, three, four. That's the way they do it in Imperial Assault, and it works. But you, there is no way in the box, which yeah. is frustrating. There are lots of people out there that propose better ways of tracking things. So I got to say, like, yeah, it sucks. Not everything fits on the map. Yeah, it sucks. The decommissioning track, but it doesn't break the game. No, it, but... it still works. It's a, it's an annoyance. It might be a major annoyance to some people. I found it relatively minor. We just have to come up with a better system. Maybe we stack the damage underneath, but then you're not going to know how much damage people are taking. You're going to want to have to pick them up, whatever it happens to be. My biggest complaint, though, and one that I haven't seen a fix for, unless someone's done something on their own, is that this is not a campaign game. Despite the fact we are saying that it comes with Season 1 and six scenarios as part of Season 1, and theoretically, these tell a link story. This is not a campaign. When you sit down to play, you pick any of the scenarios you own, one through six with the core box, or if you kickstarted it, you could start on season three, scenario two. There's no reason you have to play these in order. Not only that, but what you do in one scenario has zero, zilch, nada, no effect on any future game you will play. This shocks me because this was designed by Rob Davio. The godfather of the legacy game, the man behind Risk Legacy, Pandemic Legacy, Seafall. Like, I was honestly shocked to learn there's no campaign element to Death May Die. Shocked, and I've got to say, very disappointed. So essentially, what you've got in the retail box is 12 plays before you have to start restarting. So if you've got a, if you've got a regular group of players, you're going to sit down and you can do episodes one through six with Cthulhu and then come back and do episodes one through six with you shall not be named. And then you have now played every scenario. Now, I mean, that's 12 weeks and that may be more than worth your money. That's, that's totally a call we leave up to you. But well, also you could try all of those with different sets of characters, which does add replayability. This sure. is not a legacy game. Like sure. the way Sean's saying it, no, you can replay mm -hmm. scenario one versus Cthulhu. I can totally see doing it. You haven't, there's nothing spoiled. There, because this is not an investigation game, because you're not finding clues and you're not having to solve a mystery, nothing gets spoiled by playing the game. Nothing gets so spoiled except, nothing to stop but you. at the same time, once you've beaten it, I, 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 I don't know, try it with a different group of characters. That's like every board game out there. Once you play Puerto Rico, you've seen everything that happens. I don't see that any different than playing Scenario 1 versus Cthulhu. You've played it, you see everything that happens, you could enjoy it again with a different group of players. Well, except I see, I see a difference between, and whereas when you're playing versus a, a co-op versus board game versus a competitive game. Uh, a competitive game has more replayability to me yeah. than, than a co-op with a set scenario. 
Um, but you're not ruining the game. There is no, nothing absolutely to stop not. you from replaying those scenarios again. Absolutely not. And again, I'm talking minimums. Uh, you know, again, minimum 12 plays because to get the full experience um, before you start experimenting, you know, without experimenting with characters and, and whatnot and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so again, 12 plays isn't all that bad. Uh, I don't know what retail cost is. Do you know what MSRP is? No. Off, off of the uh, um, off I'm, my top I'm of my head. Yeah, no. I'm sure it's not. I'm sure it's not I'm sure cheap. It's not cheap. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but you know, twelve game. Even if you just say it's twelve games, um, you know, it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be a hundred dollar game. So, um, I'm going to guess more than a hundred. Oh, okay. I, I again, I have the uh, ah, fair enough. Cool um, mini or not miniatures? We are looking at no less than I thought. So season one, I don't know if this is accurate, but it's pre order on Amazon right now for seventy nine. Okay. Season two is also seventy. So you're looking at the, almost the full price of the game for additional seasons. Individual elder gods are thirty bucks each. Okay. Um, alternate figures are thirty five. There's the wow. There's a lot of stuff out. Yeah, there. you can buy. You can buy a lot. The Kickstarter really went over well, so there's a lot there. Yeah. But I don't. You know, to me, I, I don't think eighty dollars for this game, even no, if you I, just played bad. it, even if you just played it twelve times and put it away, that's not a bad deal because it was a really fun game for five people. So, so that gets back to me. Now, I can admit, I was disappointed. Um, Solon, who gave me the game to unbox, was a little worried when he saw the unboxing video, and I was so bummed to find out it doesn't. I like campaign games. I'm a role player. I want to level up a character. I, I want what I do in one scenario to affect the next, right? Again, we have a whole podcast about the difference between campaign and scenario play and my love of campaign play. I was really bummed that this did not have campaign play, especially with Rob Davio's name on the box, right? Like, to me, it almost feels like false advertising. I, I guess I'm, I'm bad for trying to make Rob a one stick pony, but I just felt like it should have, especially with the box. I'm like, oh, there's going to be boxes to open. No, you like you have more campaign play in Harry Potter Hogwarts battle than you do in this. But that all said, and the fact I'm bummed that it's not a campaign game, I did have a lot of fun playing Cthulhu Death May Die. This is a really solid cooperative dice chucker. It's very accessible, very easy to learn, lightning quick to get to the table. Pick a scenario, pick a god, go kick some butt. I love how different this is from all the other Mythos games I've played. At this point, I would say this is my favorite, uh, well, I, I can't even talk, my favorite Cthulhu-based game. I am not a huge fan of Arkham Horror, Elder Horror, Elder Sign, Tower of Madness, or any of those. I am a fan of this. I strongly suggest anyone who wants something a bit different from their Lovecraft-inspired tabletop games, all about investigating and finding the clues and finding the right book and putting the symbols in the right order. Toss all that out. Take a look at this. Check this game out. This is a two-fisted pulp dice chucker, scenario-based, but not a campaign. Don't come here if you're looking for a campaign. To read that, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Uh, what the heck? We should probably jump into the lobby here. That's oh. missing. Shouldn't there be one right here? Oh, uh, we, we had some adjustments. We're in the lobby now. <laughs> All right. All Just because right. I saw some thoughts going by. Um, Jeff, there was one. He said, Herbert West versus Charles Dexter Ward. That was exactly my point, right? That's the that's the the feel of this. This is, the like I said, the Robert E. Howard style Cthulhu, the, the kick Cthulhu's butt, not the slow descent into madness. Yeah which I thought was really neat, a very unique way to uh, to present it. And um, so different, and, and it's an Eric Lang game, and it's not folk on a map. It's minis, but it's not that. I thought that was really neat. It, I mean, it, there is a psychological aspect, but it's a physically related psychological aspect, really. Uh, you know, again, that whole psychosis is driving the characters further uh, and in, in accomplishment to the to that edge before they fall off the edge at the you know yeah. at their inevitable end. Um, the other thing I thought this did a really good job of is the pulp genre, the the pulp trope, I guess it would be the that you see in all pulp where you get beat down at the beginning because you suck. You you are losing. The cultists are hard to defeat. You feel overwhelmed. Everything's getting lit on fire. Oh my god, we're gonna lose. To no, you just start slowly battling back, right? You're going to the point where you're getting tougher and tougher the more you get beat up. So the, it's the Indiana Jones, right? Indiana Jones get his butt whipped, but at the end, he's now punching out Germans, yeah. right? It's the it's that style of it's the Dresden Files also 
leans heavily on the pulp influence, right? If you read the Dresden Files novels, it's Harry gets beat up, Harry gets beat up, Harry gets beat up, Harry gets beat up, Harry gets beat up. Oh, Harry starts fighting back, then Harry's kicking ass. That, that, there's more of a yeah. up and down in there. Usually he fights back for a bit and then gets beat down again, but that's, you, you basically get that. Spider-Man, same thing, yeah, yeah. right? And <laughs> Jeff, Jeff. Yeah, so Jeff's, Jeff's saying, is beating up the Elder God difficult or is it super pulpy? I would say it's actually rather difficult. Uh, the the one thing, and we, we mentioned that we, I briefly mentioned this in the, the review, the one thing that sort of holds it back from being difficult is line of sight. Um, yeah. Again, my character was able to shoot initially one room away, and then it was, it was as like I powered up, corner, two rooms away. Um, and, and it wasn't so, even the two rooms, it was the fact the rooms were down a set of stairs. Yeah, so, so like... I was shooting out a hallway and then down a set of stairs to hit Cthulhu. Yeah, that was a little uh, and we had to double check uh, that was like the one reason we pulled up in the rules because like really is this really possible and yes it was i mean the rules yeah specifically I wonder stated you might come out for that yeah and and you had to kick cthulhu's butt four three, times i think uh it was. three i think it was just three deaths this, well because first he summons and then when he summons something happens and then with cthulhu something happens at the end of every round once he's there you had to do 12 damage to him. So you're looking for 12 exclamation points. And at this point, the most dice you're probably rolling is four. So four if you get five, really yeah. lucky, you're going to do four damage. Um, then you do 12 damage to him. Then he switches to a new Cthulhu where he starts summoning cults, as I think. And you have to beat do 12 damage to him again. And then he gets even more tough. And yeah. you have to do another 12 damage. So every, every time he evolves, you keep the last set of effects and have to do another 12 damage. Yeah damage so yeah, it's, everything's it's rough back. so like the, yeah. the the first cthulhu's effects still happen the second cthulhu or the second what do we call it the evolution right they're yeah. like this is not my final form yeah. yeah we were joking about that yeah no absolutely uh no it was definitely fun though i mean there was just yes. something about being a screaming screaming laughing child shooting fire bolts at an elder god that really kind of you know was uh relaxing yes uh <sighs> Stage two fight, boss fight music. It, 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 was, it was the end of um, Final Fantasy, One Winged Angel going on for sure, where you're like, <laughs> I finally beat Seth Roth. Oh, no, he's back. Oh, I finally beat Seth. Oh, no, he's back. Except we knew that there was a pile of decks you had to go through. Yeah. And that's the same for both Elder Gods. Well, the two we, we have yeah. is you have to fight through multiple incarnations. Um, I don't know. We played Scenario 1. Maybe Scenario 1's easier than the other ones. Uh, I gotta admit, at the beginning, it felt pretty desperate. Like, it did it's not true. feel like we were doing well. And, we I mean, had... Realistically, if we had had, if there had been cultists in the room with me, it would have been a very different game. Yeah. So Yeah, and the cultists just kept coming. They, yeah. And coming, and coming. Well, and, and we, we cleared out... Oh we, my god. Fire. We cleared out the fire of my room, and that was one of the big things, was because there was nothing else in my room to catch fire... Yeah. Uh, that was nice but everywhere else was just engulfed in flames yeah we had a lot of, we ran out of fire tokens which was very clear in the rule book that if you run out of tokens you stop like there there is a cent amount of things yeah which we were able to metagame which was interesting but you know what that's that's pretty much a co-op game thing yeah. metagaming and co-op games kind of go hand to hand yeah i would like to see more dice though because i ran out and i don't feel yeah. like it's going to be no, that hard to dice. run out of dice. We found out the dice were saved the number and reroll. Yeah, but just add more dice. I mean, you, there's a set yeah. number of maximum dice you're able to roll. Um, they they just didn't include enough dice. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, it's probably rare that you get that many. <laughs> I don't know. I think if you get up high enough, depending on which which skill you level up, yeah. some of them will give you more green dice, and you always get more as you, you get more, yes. go insanity anyway. So I don't know. It seems like they they might have chinsed a little bit on that, but you know. Yeah, Unless like going insane yeah. can hurt your friends. That was part of it too that we didn't yep. really get into in the review. But it, there's you get a track, and on the track are multiple stop points. And anytime you hit those stop points, you level up. But your um, get the term for it. Your insanity. That's not the proper psychosis. Term, your, psychosis. your psychosis goes off. And like one of our character psychosis was they damaged everyone in the room with them, including our friends. Right? Like they yep. weren't all like mine was I go catatonic and I missed my turn, which was not as as bad. Uh, quarterbacking, I think it was so-so. We we were telling each other what to do somewhat, but this was much more of a you're playing your own character. It was it was you're asymmetric making enough. The decisions on what to level up, and you tended to each be good at something. Like my character was good at soaking damage, and I think in general, at least on our first few plays, it's going to be you're focused on your own character. Once you played a bunch and you know what everyone else's abilities are, 
I could see it happening more. Like, yeah. hey, don't you have that ability? Yeah. But because we were all focused on our own characters, there wasn't, I didn't know what Sean could do, so I couldn't tell him what to do. Yeah, I think if you if you learned all the characters, um, even then you'd still have to think about the psychoses. So, yeah, I mean, there's, would... there's enough asymm asymmetry in the game that you really can sort of minimize that quarterbacking uh, just purely due to the, to the yeah. amount of, of potential uh, things that are happening. And then again, with each scenario being different enough, um, what you have to achieve is going to be different enough that, you know, I, I, I suspect, uh, while if you've played the whole thing, yes, you can probably quarterback it, but until then you, it's probably minimized. Yeah. It, it didn't seem to be like, not to the extent I've seen it in pandemic and I could see there was some, this was more of, um, plus the pulpy feel, right? This was a dice chucker. There, this was a, an Ameritrash game. This was no Euro. This was rolling dice. And it was, eh, I'm going to try this, or eh, I'm going to try that and see if it works. It was all output randomness, not input randomness. Yep. So, like, you could tell someone, eh, you should go attack that cultist. Like, well, I only get four dice. You can't be like, here, move here, do this. This will happen for sure. And when that happens, you should do this because that happened. You couldn't plan like that. Like, in Pandemic, that's why yep. you have the quarterbacking. Is It's all open info, and it's like, well, if you do this, 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 and this, here's our result. Whereas... In this game, you don't know. You're like, here, you could go try to do this yeah. or try to do that, and then <laughs> you, you're going to roll the dice and see if it works. You can head over there, but you're either going to succeed and kill the cultist, or you're going to lay on the floor and drool. Like, we did we did yeah. have the usual uh, co-op game thing, where it's like, yeah. we discussed. It. I think you should probably go over here and fight the fire, or should you go smash the labs? Yeah, yeah you know what? We're not smashing labs. You I, smash labs. I'm not, I'm not leaving this room a... because I can help us win if I stay here. <laughs> Again, yeah. you know. There was never a where someone picked up another person's character and went move here. Yeah, no, no, absolutely not. All righty, I think we should get going on. All right.